Give it up for Carmen. Brown skin. It's that D'Angelo brown skin. I like that. I heard her uh, preparing in the back, and I, I knew you were in for a treat. I was bobbing my head the whole time. Um, I want to say thank you to Carmen. Uh, again, we want to say thank you to American Family. Uh, I'm proud and thankful for the sponsorship of American Family, but uh, I'm not always impressed with big donors who give money sometimes, because sometimes you can give money, and that kind of eases your hands for what you do. But when I see people give money, but there's some heart behind that, that donation, that means so much more. So thank you, Naira Jordan. Thank you, American Family. Um, I'm going to just veer just a bit. We're on a time schedule, but I just got to give a big shout out to Public Allies. They just here representing. Look, look at them. Y'all stand up. Let's give it up for them. We love why you're here. We love what you do. Continue to be strong. Stay focused. We're proud of you. The lived experience of disenfranchisement, as we talk about criminal justice reform, reimagining solutions, reimagining possibilities. I've asked a lot of the moderators to give me bios of themselves. And sometimes you'll get these long bios so people can kind of let you know what they were doing. Uh, but our next moderator gave me a, a different kind of bio. So what I want you to do is just start clapping. And every time I say a word, I want you to clap even louder because we're going to welcome Sean Wilson to the stage. So start my clapping. He is from Milwaukee, born and raised in this community. He is an activist, a change agent. He is a movement builder. Let us welcome our moderator for criminal justice reform, reimagining solutions, Brother Sean Wilson. Good morning. Thank you, Kwaku. Um, I don't know how to come behind that. Um, as Kwaku said, my name is Sean Wilson. I am the statewide organizer for the American Civil Liberties Union's Campaign for Smart Justice, a nationwide campaign committed to reducing the prison population in half by 50 percent and fighting racism within the criminal legal system. This is a campaign that is led by directly impacted people all over the country. This is a campaign that is centering the leadership of directly impacted communities because we believe that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Two decades ago, I disappeared from the Milwaukee neighborhood known as 53206, the zip code with the highest carceral rate in the United States. As painful as my own story is, the 17 years I spent incarcerated, separated from my family, continuously paying for a transgression I committed as a teenager. Facing horrible experiences within those prison walls, one thing reigns true. My story is not unique. Currently, there are 2.3 million men and women, people, in cages all over our country. 2.3 million. And another 4.5 million men and women, people, who are on probation and parole at an annual cost to taxpayers of, of $80 billion, and the human cost even worse, incalculable. But these numbers may not mean anything to you, and perhaps they shouldn't. What should matter is the real life stories of the impacted men and women who are here this morning to share their personal horrors and hopes experienced in our criminal legal system. So with that, I would like to transition to our panel discussion um, I have conversations with these amazing panelists. They have great stories. They're doing great things all over the country. So if I can have our panelists come up and um, introduce themselves. And, um, <laughs> Richard Cabral, um, Corey Thompson, and Alcus Thompson. We can start. We can start with Corey. Corey, you can go ahead and give us a little bit of background. Of Where I am, who I am, and yes, what I who did. you are, and what you what you're working on. Uh, my name is Corey Thomas. I live in New York. I'm a playwright and screenwriter. Uh, the reason I'm here was almost an accident. I uh, had never stepped foot in a prison in the United States, and I did that 
It's going on four years now uh, because of a project I was working on, a podcast I'd been hired to write the narration for, which ended up not even working. But uh, there are a few things that happened that first time that I went into the prison um, that changed my life completely. I walked in the gates with really low expectations of what I was going to find there. I did not expect to meet people that I was really going to um, care about. Uh, I think my, my impressions were based on media images and uh, things like that, you know. So I walked into the prison not really expecting a whole lot. And I walked through the yard. The first thing that happened was walking through the prison yard and seeing hundreds of men who looked as if they could be members of my family. So that's the first thing. It was like the visual punch in my stomach of seeing such a large number of black and brown men as opposed to a much, much smaller number of white men. So that was the first thing that just completely took me aback. I mean, I know, I read, uh, but when you see it, it's, it's really, really uh, something. Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, the two producers and I who were there went into a room and we met with about 30 men. And there was not a single one of them who met my expectations. They, they were amazing people and I could not understand why they were incarcerated. And so when I left the prison that day, I felt so ashamed that I had prejudged them and the scenario and I realized that if I had done that, then how many other people do that? And I realized that I wanted to use the tools that are at my disposal, um, which I'm just a writer, so I decided I wanted to write a play about prison. Um, as fate happens, I was commissioned by a theater to write about whatever I want, so I was now gonna be paid for writing the play about prison, which was, was amazing. But the second thing that happened was the day that I had been there, I had met a man who we spoke a little bit about theater. I was telling him I was a writer and he told me that he had started an organization in the prison and did I want to maybe collaborate with him because they had done a play some years ago and they wanted to do something again. And this will go to show how little I know about prison because I gave him my phone number and email. I didn't know that you can't call a person <laughs> and you can't email. Um, but anyway, it took about four four months and I got a call from a supervisor who invited me and cleared me to come in and work with this man. He has a program called No More Tears, which is an anti-violence program. So the other interesting thing is that I work with an anti-violence program. I'm not doing an arts program, but we do do the arts in that program to help teach um, putting a face on violence and that sort of thing. But I wrote a play uh, called Lockdown that was um, inspired and really formed and shaped by the men that I met in this prison. I decided that I wanted to try to give them a voice to the best of my ability. I wanted to honor them by sharing their experience with the world. I wanted, to, wanted it to be as accurate and authentic as possible. And so they all jumped on board and helped me and the play is so much of a collaborative effort. Um, Lonnie Morris, the man who, who runs that organization, who's been incarcerated, he's in his 44th year of incarceration, read every draft and you know, helped me. Other people gave me vocabulary lessons so I'd get all of the slang right. I mean, everything was shaped by these men who wanted to help me, um, help them with their image. I wanted to give them a voice and share them. So. That's why I'm here. It was produced in New York in the spring, and we're hoping that it's gonna have other productions. There was a conversation after every performance, and a lot of people with lived experience came, and the response was so gratifying by the people who had the experience, who it seemed as if for one of the first times was seeing their actual experience um, on stage. They had not had that experience before, and then people who did not know learned something about uh, what it is to be incarcerated. Thank you, Gord. Richard. My name is um, Richard Cabral. 
um, from, from East Los Angeles, born and raised. Uh, my family comes from Mexico. Uh, my family have been, been involved in gangs since the 1970s. Um, I come from a broken community, broken home. My dad left me when I was two years old. Um, and I tell you these things just so you understand um, how my upbringing was because this will ultimately be, my, be the reason why I started my incarceration at 13 years old. So um, at 13 years old, I, I would start my incarceration. So from 13 to 25, I was incarcerated. Um, I was a gang member, drugs, the whole broken community, um, generational trauma is, is how I grew up. At 20 years old, I shot a man in East Los Angeles and I was charged with um, an attempted murder um, and I was facing 35 years to life, 25 for the attempted murder, 10 years for the gang allegations. Uh, they dropped it down to great bodily injury and I went and I got five years in prison um, to Hatchapi, Lancaster, Ironwood. I would get out when I was 25 years old and uh, there's an organization called Homeboy Industries, which is the biggest gang nonprofit organization in the world. It's been servicing thousands upon thousands of gang members from Los Angeles. Um, that want to turn their life around and they give them the tools in, in order to, to truly find themselves. It's not even about coming back into society. It's about healing the trauma that has, that has been in place that was, done, that was done upon them. So I started there two years working in the Homeboy Bakery. We have a bakery. Um, I would, uh, Christopher Sholak, the showrunner of Southland, would give me my first acting gig. So from there, the seed was, the seed was placed that that I could actually do this. Fast forward, I would start um, acting classes. Five years later, I would meet John Ridley. And I would, that would be my first starring um, show. He, he would cast me as, as Hector Taunts, and that year I got nominated for an Emmy on, on American Crime. I've been out 12 years. I'm a father of four um, and my beautiful wife. And I still come back and I am involved in the community because this is what made me. And I am a storyteller and I, I, I'm an actor. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alcus Thompson. I'm originally from Milwaukee. Um, I served 18 years in prison. Um, basically, I want to kind of give you the story of me so you can understand why I went the route that I went. Um, had a beautiful upbringing, um, great mother. My father died at eight when I was eight years old. And so my mother, she doesn't depend on government assistance or anything. She had two jobs. And Everything, her work ethics was just tremendous, and we don't understand how, basically, when I give my other siblings, how was she able to do this? And um, take care of nine kids, I'm the youngest out of nine, and so every night it seemed like when, um, when she get home, she cooked for us. Uh, once she did that, I can hear her voice. I can actually hear her right now. She called me, she said, Todd, and I go upstairs and she like, baby, my feet is hurting. Rub my feet, you know. I rub her feet until she falls asleep. And this was like a, a routine. And so she would give you her last $2 out of her purse. And I saw that she always told us to hold our heads up high. And I saw her where, uh, we would suffer, but she would like say, hey, just because we doing bad, don't nobody have to know it. You know, so our clothes press iron every day. Um, beds are made, she did everything. I never made my bed when I was little. And so uh, at the age of 15, uh, I was able to see a lot by my other siblings. So at the age of 15, I, First started smoking weed when I was nine. Um, my other siblings, you know, they, the little brother, okay, let him try it, then they get to laugh at you a little bit. So when I was about 15, I started seeing other things, started seeing my community with other drugs and stuff. So at the age of 15, I decided that I was gonna be a drug dealer. 
and stopped going to school. Even though I did go to school just to satisfy my mother, but I knew my occupation was to be able to um, make her happy, to be able to give her things that um, she never got to enjoy in her life. And um, even though they may look like wrong decisions to you, I may regret doing all the time that I've done, but I do not regret the choices that I made because it was the only outlet that I could see. A lot of people don't get to, you know, get to um, see my vision on what you have to do to be able to come out of a poor environment to be able to live a productive life. So I went through the, I went through that to end up being, um, going into the court procedures, end up facing 35 years in prison, end up getting out in 18, um, And so during the court time, you actually like see how the new slavery time have started forming. Basically, um, they take young people that's not familiar with the laws and um, they trade you. Basically, the people that want to fight for their life, they will face life sentence compared to people that want to be, uh, as we call them, snitches. So basically, I went to trial, so the prosecutor and my attorney that didn't fight for me, they actually trade my time for me going to, for my attorney not to fight for me, it probably saved like five other guys from doing mandatory sentence in their, in their time. I am hope I'm kind of like explaining this kind of good, but it's kind of nervous being up here for me at the same time. <laughs> uh, so basically, it's like a trade war. So it's kind of like remind me of like, a, 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 you know, just modern day slavery. Because why would you play with people's lives like this? You know, uh, and none of us did end up doing, was able to do no less than 10 years anyways. So they traded off my life to, uh, just as a, a game between themselves to make the prosecutors look good so they can actually run for higher office later on, later on in time. But when the public get to see things like this, they only hear about the bare part of the, oh, it's a gang war. You know, I never even owned a gun that got charged for a gun. Never owned a gun in my life. Never even had a gun in my house. Uh, a guy that actually, like, um, told on me, basically, he had guns registered in his name, in his house. They took his charges off of him, said I had assets to be able to use his gun and gave me five extra years. So this is the type of things that we have to face when, um, when you're a minority, dealing in a society of, of privileged people. Um, even when you go to jail, it's that way, you know, where, um, when I first went to federal prison, you won't realize uh, we had car shows there. We had women playing volleyball there. Um, we had pizzas delivered on certain, certain months. We had Kentucky Fried Chicken delivered there. But once they started incarcerating black and brown people, all that was stricken away. And then that's when it came to tougher sentence, tougher laws, um, overstacked population in rooms, um, eight by 10 rooms with four people in it, two on the floor, two in beds, um, food not the greatest. And um, I think in society, I'm kind of like Roman a little bit, please forgive me, but I think in society, people think I, this may sound strange, but I think 95% of Americans need to go to prison. And the reason why I say that because everything is the same. You have, not, you have four o'clock stand-up count. You eat at the same time. You sleep at the same time. Everything looks the same. So you only have $200 to spend a month. 
So if you're rich, you still can only spend the $200 that I spend. The clothes look the same. So I think we all have, we all can be, be able to respect each other. Only thing you can do is just look into the next person and know they are the same as you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and transition to a video uh, uh, of Todd to speak a little bit more to um, his story. So give him one. Well. In 1989, 28 years old, facing 35 years, didn't find no drugs on me, but I was charged with 200 keys. I can remember my mother tell me that if you or your brother happen to ever go to jail, y'all gonna be the death of me. My mother was about 68 when I went to jail. I knew we would never see each other again. you want to speak just briefly about what we just saw? Uh, yes, um, I'm, me and a guy named Dave Newberg, we're actually writing um, a 13 part series of film on my life story. And um, wow, that just remind me, uh, my mother actually died when I was talking to her on the phone in prison. And uh, wow. Um, so, uh, and this is a trip too. Um, she died at 722 and them is actually my birth numbers. So I always look at it, I said, wow, is she just trying to tell me she will always be with me? I, that's just something I probably would never understand, but you know, your mother dying and you talk to her on the phone and she dies at your birth numbers. Speechless, bro. Yeah, it, 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 and, and, <laughs> Let's and, talk. Absolutely, and, and, and that resonates with me so much because um, 17 days before I was released from prison, my grandmother died, the woman who raised me. So, and, and, and Alk is telling that story, you know, that's the only thing that I was thinking about was that, um, I re, I, and I recall several conversations I had with my grandmother um, who wanted to move to Memphis, Tennessee, and who told me that she wasn't going anywhere until I came home. And I didn't realize that she was going to be leaving this earth um, when I came home. Um, the woman who raised me the, all of my life and who made sure that um, the phone was on, that I had canteen 17 days before I came home. The only person I wanted to see, she died. So that kind of resonated with me and um, is part of my why as to why I do this work. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in, in the criminal legal system, it's, there's a lot of trauma. Um, there's a lot of trauma, and I think that what many of us have done at, on this panel, what we have done is we've taken our trauma and we have internalized it, and it is the reason why we do the work that we're doing. This is part of our healing. Um, so I'm going to, the, the first question many of our panelists um, answered already, so I'm just going to go ahead and transition to um, the next question. And that question, and anyone can answer it, is how has your passion for this issue in issue inspired your craft and how has your how has your craft supported your work in the area of criminal justice reform um, I'll tell a little story about my play um, after after each performance there was a conversation and there were some absolutely remarkable things that happened um, when the play was produced and the artistic director of the theater said she wanted to have these conversations I was a little bit like against it because I was like, I didn't write a, a lesson, I wrote a play, you know, and I just wanted it to be respected as a play, as a piece of art. And then the conversations ended up being the most gratifying and amazing part of the experience 
for instance, um, there was, there's an organization in New York that brings police and young uh, men together in at-risk neighborhoods, marginalized neighborhoods. And uh, there was a group of police who came to see the play. There were about eight officers in that theater with their guns and uniforms and everything. And my play is about a man who is in his 46th year of incarceration who shot and killed a policeman in the course of a robbery. And so I was, you know, like, oh my goodness, all these police are here. And uh, after, the, after the performance, there was a conversation with a chief and a young man who was representing a group of young uh, men who were in the audience also. And it was one of the most remarkable conversations I've ever seen um, because somehow the play had inspired them and opened uh, their hearts to allow them to speak to each other. Um, I don't think I realized it, but I guess by having mm -hmm. the victim of the crime in the play be a policeman, it allowed, um, it allowed the police not to feel attacked, I guess, so that it opened them up to actually have a very frank and honest conversation. But the most amazing thing that happened was the young man who was up there that day speaking with the chief. And he was really articulate and frank and angry about what happens out in the streets and the way young men of color are treated by police. And a few months after the play, a cousin of his was shot and killed on the street and he went to try to, he got ready to handle it the street way. Mm -hmm. um, and he remembered the play and he called the organization that had brought them together that day and he said, I, I wanna go and do something to avenge my cousin's murder, but I keep thinking about that play. And so can I speak to that chief instead? And so, I mean, that's, that, that's a remarkable thing. And so, um, and there were other little things like that. That's one of the more dramatic um, incidences. So I think that it just caused me to realize um, without even recognizing, I think the amount of time and the detail that ended up in my play because of the time I had spent in the prison and the number of people who collaborated, opened up their hearts to me and really shared intimate details of their life because we'd grown to trust each other. Um, that there were, there were things in there that just resonated with people in a way that a lot of times the media um, and art projects don't allow for. So I think it's just so important to give a voice to people who have actual experience. Um, you know, when you're creating art. Right. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things, um, becoming an actor, uh, a working actor in, in the industry is, is how many men and women have came up to me at Homeboys, because I'm at Homeboys all the time, right? And it's just this, this beehive of homies and homegirls and people that have been out for quite some time and people that are giving back and now drug counselors. So you have this mesh of, of people that come from the community. But now that I've been there since, right, like, I mean, eight years, right when stuff started, like, I really started working, like, how many men and women wanted to become an actor now, right? And, and I think that was the biggest thing because now they've seen it possible, right? And, and before me, in, th in this certain community, there was no, there was no one. And so, it, and it was something that I couldn't leave them behind, right? I couldn't, I, and one of the hardest things I remember that there was nobody to, to help me on this journey of becoming an actor, right? I was the only guy from the barrio sitting in an acting studio. Like, and this is Hollywood, right? So you got like all these like beautiful people and, you know, and, and like in my mind, I'm like, what the hell are you doing here, Richard, right? Like, and I would just sit in the corner, but I knew that just stick it out, sit here and, and you're gonna learn, right? If whatever you wanna be, you must learn the craft of it. And that was the intention that I went in with. Um, but from that, from that point, it was countless of homies coming up to me like, Richard, I want to become an actor now. I want to become an actor. And even though that they didn't know the real day-to-day -day and the work behind becoming an actor, it was just a blessing that they even thought that they could become that, right? So I started an acting, I started an acting scholarship with my acting coach. So any homie or homegirl or anybody from the barrio that came out of the, uh, of the streets and wanted to become an actor, they would get a free ride for the first month. 
Uh, and so the first month we put it that they would understand what the, what, what the grind is, right? They would understand having to be in an acting class, you know, uh, late at night and scene study and all the work that goes behind it. And after that month, if they wanted to really commit, then we would work it out that they would be able to come to the acting studio. So I think that's been, been one of the most um, powerful things right there, right? To have like, and we've been running this for maybe like six, seven years, and there's been countless of, of, of guys that came in like that. And one guy that, that I really remember, his name is Clayton Cardenas, right? So Clayton is, um, uh, my new show is called The Mayans. It's on FX, I'm starting in that. So Clayton is, is, one, is, the main, is one of the main guys. And Clayton first seen me on a movie that I had did called The Better Life. So again, we do these things and we don't know how it's gonna play out in the world, but it plays out. So that's definitely one of the um, biggest experience that I've had in, in, in um, merging art and what my life, how my life started and what my life is now. Um, one of the biggest things for me is uh, I left my daughter at one years old uh, when I was first incarcerated. So it, the communication was like, pretty rough. Uh, her mother um, went on to have a different relationship, ended up getting married. In that relationship, she had a, another daughter. They eventually got a divorce, and basically about two years, I was not able to be in contact with my daughter and didn't know anything that was going on. Uh, next thing I find out is basically um, through their divorce, she had gave my daughter to the guy that she married with, that had her daughter. And I just so happened to know the guy and we went to high school together. Um, and I was also wondering, I said, why, why have nobody in my family uh, step up to the plate? And then I started thinking, I said, wow, uh, is it too much on, for them to raise another child? Is this something that they really want to do? I mean, I had a lot, I was super angry about it. And I asked them the same question, which they couldn't really give a real clear, honest answer to. But um, I ended up talking to the guy that ended up raising my daughter and he was letting me know that she's safe. She wanted to be there with her sister. Um, he brought her to see me in prison. So basically this led to me wanting to do Team Todd. Team Todd is basically helping kids to become, with incarcerated parents, to become entrepreneurs, to just, um, to learn how to be successful in life. And we're the groundwork and we're there with them every day. Um, I have a kid that um, basically, some of them are related to me, uh, we call it uh, Team Top Japan, I got uh, one of my nephews to go to school there. I helped fund him to be able to go to school in Japan. He, and now he's, um, he's got his own brand of clothing line that he's coming out with, but basically it's staying over there because he don't want to bring it into the United States early. Um, I helped his brother go to college. They got two business degrees in Atlanta. I help another prisoner that got his own uh, lawn care service in um, Tennessee. Um, and I got this uh, really amazing kid um, named Trayvon, and he's probably out there in the lobby at the present time. His grandparents used to live in my apartment building that I own, and they ended up um, moving out. I ran into Trayvon one day on the street and I was asking about his grandparents, and then I asked how he was doing. This kid said, I have three jobs, and I was going to school to get my high school diploma, but I'm homeless. And I just so happened to have an apartment just open that same day. So I actually put him in my apartment building, gave him some rules and regulations, then charged him, and um, he ended up being like one of the first recipients up on the team top. Everything I, I have done, I fund myself. I gave him a thousand dollars for his um, college. And one day me and Trayvon was just riding down the street. And he said, you know, I was in this competition 
and I um, finished second place. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I make a coffee with vegetables and fruit. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, um, let me try it. I said, make me some one day. And I tried it, and it was like super good. And so, um, and so from there, we've been like um, at the outposts, different pop-ups. It sells out everywhere. And I can't mention this at the present time, but he, we actually was on a, uh, in another competition, and he actually finished first place. So that's what Teen Todd is. We're about to uplift these kids and take them to a different level. And, and so what we're hearing in, in all three of our panelists, and I'm a big believer of this as well, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, is that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Yeah. So as a parent, Todd decided to create something that would inform and educate parents who have been incarcerated to right. be better parents. Right. To be better parents. Richard spoke about homeboys and homegirls and how they, he were creating opportunities for them because in the hood, that's what everyone wants to be. Everyone wants to be a rapper. Everyone wants to be an actor. Everyone wants to be an athlete. So we have to create these opportunities for these individuals in these quote unquote disadvantaged or marginalized neighborhoods so that they can be the great individuals we know that they can be. The way you heal from trauma is through opportunity. One of the ways that you heal from trauma is through opportunities. So individuals who have been impacted by the criminal legal system here in this country understands that if only they had the opportunity to pursue their dreams without the obstacles and the barriers placed in front of them, they probably would have been diverted from a jail cell. So what are some of the solutions would you put forward to alleviate the challenges with the current system? We know that we have 2.3 um, million people in cages. We know that we have another 4.5 million people on probation and parole. I, I like to say whenever I give these types of talks or whenever I'm sitting on the panel is that the current legal criminal legal system is um, the, a continuum of slavery because we have the 13th Amendment that says that um, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the United States except as a punishment for a crime. So in a, essentially, if you commit a crime, you become a slave, no matter what color you are. So the current system that is before us is a continuation of a system that we were told was abolished. Right. Chattel slavery was abolished. So there is no longer folks being put in chains, right. you know, but they're being handcuffed, they're being shackled, right. Right. you know, but we have a more sophisticated form of slavery in our criminal legal system. So. What are some solutions which you put forward to alleviate the challenges with the current system? I mean, I think the first thing that has to happen is the perception of the public and the, the, the emphasis on punishment as opposed to um, restoration, rehabilitation, healing, um, forgiveness, understanding that people uh, change. Mm -hmm. People Absolutely. don't seem to believe that people change. The, the parole system is ridiculous. Um, you know, somebody who's been incarcerated 40 years, they'll go in there and all they'll do is go over the crime that was committed 40 years before. And so the person never really has an opportunity to leave. So the parole system needs to be reformed. Just the idea of somebody spending their whole life behind bars. I've met so many remarkable, remarkable, exceptional human beings who are spending their whole lives in prison, people who went in at 13, 16, and are now in their 40s and 50s, living their whole lives and have something so valuable to offer. Because there's something else that I've learned now spending a lot of time and meeting a lot of incarcerated individuals, that there's a special, there are special qualities and skills that people who are incarcerated have acquired mm -hmm because of their experience that would make our community safer. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing how men take care of each other. Um, you know, I'm a woman and I've spent a lot of time with a lot of men now and 
the accountability that I see men take for their actions is inspiring and has taught me so much about humility, um, forgiveness, um, and wisdom, and understanding, and patience. Um, so anyway, I think that, that, that men coming out now, or <coughs> women coming out who have been incarcerated, we need to also change how we receive people. Mm -hmm. There's a stigma. I think that artworks that show people, that humanize people who are incarcerated will help to remove some of the stigma mm -hmm. um, because we think of it as those people and we don't want them in our neighborhood and that sort of thing and that doesn't help anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm so, so happy about the opportunity to help people start businesses mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. People just need to start becoming humanized, Absolutely. I think, and um, we need to think of um, all of these people who have something very valuable to offer us all. Right. Definitely humanize, right? And, and what a lot of people don't understand, and we were talking about earlier, right, is the trauma that we have been through, right? The trauma that we have been through as, as little children, right? We, we, um, like, I don't know how many people have seen um, when they see us, right? And we are talking about this yesterday, you know, um, and, and, and just it, it, it reminds me of... Uh, being a child incarcerated, you know, and like, and, and what that does to the psyche of a, of a man or a woman. And these are the things we have to live by, right? We could stand right here and we could present you and we could talk with, we could present you this, this, this elaborate panel or whatever we're doing, right? I could walk that red carpet, but in my mind, trauma has, has been done to me, right? And, and I try to numb it, right? I try to mask it, but you can't really put a cap on it, right? So is, is as we approach these subjects, and if you have never experienced it, please just take your time and be sensitive to the matter. Because when people are not sensitive to this, then, then we will never really push forward like that. Um, there's many ways to get to the end goal that we're trying to, that we're trying to achieve, but through my, through my experience, it comes from um, really um, looking in myself um, and, and healing the trauma, right? And it's endless. We have men here that have spent 18 years, 17 years, practically all their life in a cage, like a caged animal. And, and so um, we're all at different places, right? What works for you was not going to work for me. What works for you was not going to work for me. So um, just that, just just being sensitive to this matter, I think is, is, is a big thing that when we approach this type of work. Thank you. I think the people that make decisions is not the ones that, that have this experience of being incarcerated. So they can never be, like he said, sensitive to the matter. Um, and don't nobody want to listen to the person that actually experienced this. Right. But we're the only ones that can really help out the matter of what incarcerated, what you can do to better it. Yeah. Um, we're, I call it the world's greatest university because we don't pay for it with money. We pay for this with our life. You, we had the experience of having solitude to be able to know yourself. A lot of people do not know themselves. We deal with this world day by day, and, it, and everything is just moving so fast where you don't have time to just catch up and just sit back, relax, to be able to sit back and relax and understand what you actually have been going through throughout your life. Um, even though it affected me as far as staying for a long time, but basically, I always used to, I say this all the time, I gave him my body, but I never gave him my mind. So by me not giving him my mind, let me help you out so we can help this whole society out. I, I don't see nothing wrong with this man right here. I don't see nothing wrong with him. So there's three people right here that's representing millions of uh, beautiful brothers that's locked up that if you give them an opportunity, things can change. But if we don't have a voice where we can help out, then things are going to continue to stay the way they are. Thank you. So I just want to I just want to chime in a little bit um, and add to some of the things that were said um, as it relates to solutions. Uh, one of the solutions, and it's rather radical, um, uh, my good brother Fred Royal, president of um, the NAACP, 
Uh, we were in a meeting the other day and he said that what we need to do is we need to rewrite the 13th Amendment mm. because it is this amendment that is the reason why this system is so racist. It is this amendment why black and brown communities are being targeted and being shipped off to prison in droves. It is the reason why here in Wisconsin we have 23 plus thousand people in cages. It is the reason why we are sending three to 4,000 people to prison each year in the state of Wisconsin for technical rules only violations. Technical rules only violations, not the commission of a new crime, but for breaking a rule of supervision. One story that we heard or I've heard throughout my travels here in the state is that an individual was sent back to prison because they moved from duplex A to duplex B and they were sent back to prison because they didn't receive prior approval from their probation or parole agent. It is arbitrary decisions, decisions like that that is impacting our economy. It is arbitrary decisions like that that is disrupting families and communities. We're paying 34000 to put people in cages in this state. And the, the cost all over the country is even higher. We're paying close to 150000 200000 in the state of Wisconsin to lock up babies kids. This is a problem. And it is individuals who have gone to prison, served their debt to society, who have changed the way that they behaved 20, 30 years ago, and have come back home and wants to be an asset to their community, to the society in which they're living in. And we have to be receptive of these individuals because 95% because of the men and women coming home, the people coming home from prison, 95% are coming home. We have to be receptive of how we are going to welcome them into our community. Because if we do not welcome them into our community, then they're going to revert back to an action that led them to prison in the first place. All of us are impacted by the criminal legal system. There's a stigma, there's a shame that comes along with knowing someone who is incarcerated you yourself being formerly incarcerated. Many of us have family members and friends who are incarcerated. Your closest friend may have a son or a daughter that is incarcerated, but they don't say anything about it and you don't know anything about it because of the shame. But the criminal legal system runs so deep in the veins of America that only way we do away with this system is that it's going to take a mindset change. Todd said that he wished 95% of Americans go to prison. I heard someone say in the audience, what? <laughs> but what he was saying was that we're already in prison. Mentally, we are restricted in how we perceive certain people and certain things. And because of that imprisonment of our minds, we have so many injustices. The prisons are a microcosm of the world. Prisons are a microcosm of the world. If you go into any prison, it will remind you of the world. Me and Richard was talking, he went into Pulaski High School yesterday. Know what he said to me? He said, man, I walked in there and it reminded me of the yard. That's prison. So we have an issue of the school to prison pipeline where we're sending our babies into facilities where they're going to be, where their trauma is going to be exacerbated. We need to start looking at how do we restore, to Corey's point, how do we restore the hurt that has been perpetrated against us as human beings? Hurt people hurt people. So let's not always resort to sending them away, exiling them into a cage as our first response. Let's figure out how do we restore the hurt that has been perpetrated against these individuals so that they can be better individuals. But if we continue to lock up people, we're going to have a whole country that is incarcerated. So we have to be um, understanding we have to be willing to accept these folks back into our community. We have to hold our elected officials accountable because any type of sustainable change 
that we want to see in our state, in our country, it's going to have to be legislative. We have presidential candidates talking about criminal justice reform. 20, 30 years ago, they wouldn't be having this conversation because the position was be tough on crime. But in the thinking of being tough on crime, we have become tough on individuals, on human beings. So we have to hold our elected officials accountable and we have to hold ourselves accountable. We have to free ourselves from our own imprisonment mentally. Before I got out of prison, I got out of prison mentally. And when I came home, I hit the ground running. And I'm able to do the work that I'm doing right now because 10 years ago when I was sitting in that cell as a 27-year-old man, I said that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. And I came home to a family that was receptive of my ideals. I came home to community and organizations that was receptive and said, how can we help you? How can we support you? And that's the reason why I'm standing here, sitting here, speaking with you all. That's the reason why we all are up here talking about the, the, this system, its impact, and what you all can do. Because we all have, before I went to prison, I used to see movies of prison. Shawshank Redemption. When my grandmother heard I was going to prison, the first thing came to her mind was Shawshank Redemption. And that devastated her. She was terrified. And I was sent to Green Bay Correctional Institution, the, one of the worst prisons in the state of Wisconsin. They called it Gladiator School. I went to this um, prison and I saw other black and brown men who were the same age or no um, older than I was, 17, 18, 19 years old, being held to the same standards as we do adults. So we have to change the way we think about this. We have to hold our elected officials accountable and we have to become engaged. And we have to listen to the stories of impacted people who have been impacted by all of these systems, whether it's sex trafficking, whether it's incarceration, whether, whatever it is. We need to listen to those folks who have been impacted because those who are closest to the uh, problem are closest to the solution. Let's listen to them. Let's allow them to lead and let's be engaged. I think we're going to transition into um, audience questions, um, Kwaku. And I hope I didn't talk a little bit. <laughs> And I'm going to stand right here so everyone knows if you have a question, that's what these two microphones are for. What we will ask, though, while you have the beautiful pads of paper for you, is to write down your question and then read the question. Oftentimes, people come here and it turns from a question to a monologue. And so for the sake of time and to be able to get other questions out, we want to make sure that we have them short and concise that the panelists can answer. If it's an appropriate query or follow-up, you can ask that question, but we ask that you be respectful for all those who may want to speak. So as people come up, I will ask the first question. So, and this one is for Richard. You speak so eloquently. Uh, and every time I get a chance to, I make sure I say this because Sean and Todd, you reminded me of this. Uh, my grandmother, wisest person I ever met in my life. She used to tell me the best way to heal yourself is to help others. Mm. And I see that in your stories right now. And the one thing you said is uh, with your brothers, your homeboys in the body, you said, we give a scholarship. Right. When you were down, what put that in your mind that not only was I going to do something that seemed impossible as far as being an actor, right. but I was going to make sure I gave back to help other people? Um, when I started, um, like, there, was, there were certain people that, that I thought that, that if anybody was going to help me, it was going to be them, and they didn't. And like, that hit me, and I was like, and I didn't wish bad upon them, I didn't wish nothing upon them, but I said, like... You, I knew I was like, bro, you have the opportunity to, to answer my question, and you're not going to answer my question. So then this goes to another system, right? I'm in this system where I thought that you, that, that, that should help me, that I'm in the free world. But then it, it turned back, was like, wow, like, that's, that's messed up. And I told myself, if I become anything, I promise myself I will not do what you did to me. That was my promise, you know? And, like, when guys used to come in, because, like, like, all I wanted was help. Like, at the end of it, all I wanted was help. And, like, you couldn't help me, right? So, like, the system is, 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 is in, in a way, like, we, we, it's self-colonization, right? We, we, we're so deep in it that we hurt our own people now, right? And, and, and when the brother's just asking for a helping hand, he wouldn't help me out. 
So that was my biggest thing. So when that, when that chance came and when that young brother came to me and he was like, Richard, could you help me? And I was like, and I lived up to my promise. And I was like, I got you, bro. I got you. That's what's up. Okay. Um, I just, I mean, we're talking art. Why can't we make fun? And we have great um, comedians. Why aren't we making fun of drug use? Why aren't we just telling people to take drugs? Like you said, like, when did you say nine you took something? Oh, nine me? years old? Oh, yeah, I started smoking weed when I was nine. So we have, I mean, why aren't we really making, of just using humor as a way of so people don't start out with drugs. And maybe you'd have an answer, and maybe you can't do it, because you have all your, maybe a lot of friends. But anyway. No, I think back in them days, it's a lot different from today, because drugs are so much harder. But really, to be at nine years old, it shouldn't have been no joke. You know, like, uh, hey, let's see how the little brother going to act why he smoke weed, you know, let's laugh at him, let's make him dance. Um, I think it was like kids being with kids and not thinking like adults and what adults should be doing. Um, I don't think in today's time, I don't think people is really taking, is really taking it like that. I think times have totally changed where drugs is like, um, it's really serious with everybody. If I can add, too, because you talk about arts being activated, there's a movie called Menace to Society. And there's this scene where the mm -hmm. main character, the protagonist named Kane, uh, when he's little, his father's a drug dealer, his mom's a drug addict, and he's on the porch with these older gentlemen, who they call the OGs, and he sees them drinking, and he asks for a drink, and they're like, go ahead, give him a drink. And he drinks it, and you kind of see how his life corresponds. Mm. But then at the end of the movie, when Cain is older and he's experienced some things, he's in the same situation where another young person asked him for a drink and he wouldn't give him it because he understands what happened to him. And when we look at arts activated in a subliminal message sent by films, sometimes films that are criticized for their violence and whatnot, we fail to see some of the deeper meanings and messages inside of there. So when we talk about arts activated, that's it in its essence. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah, I think you're next. Oh, I'm sorry. So what advice would you give to the gatekeepers who are in position to hire reentry people? Corey, you look uh, like, can you bring your chance. mic up some, Corey? I think give them a chance. I mean, I think that, that as I said, formerly incarcerated people have something to offer. First of all, there's a work ethic that I think is like really impressive um, because once a person has transformed, um, you know, I meet people that within two minutes, you know, this is a yeah. person who will never commit a crime again because they've transformed. They're, they're over the mountain. They, they know who they should have been or who they could have been. And now if they had that chance, they will never do anything to get rid of that chance. And I know, for instance, lifers, because I'm mostly working around lifers, they've got, there's less than 1% recidivism when they get out, if they get out, which is a really small percent of them do get out. Um, and the, the 1%, the less than 1% is usually breaking a parole rule. It's mm -hmm. not because they're going out and committing a crime. Um, so I've met a lot of people now who, who have left prison. I, people I've gotten to know in the prison are now leaving, and so I do my very best to help them. I was saying yesterday, there's a man who just got out three months ago, every single morning, he sends me a text, good morning. Every single morning I get a text from him that says good morning and he sends it and I was talking to someone and they said, oh, Jason sends me a good morning text every morning too. So he's sending good morning to everyone all over California who he knows. And I just, I, I, I've helped Jason out because he got out, he had a really hard time finding a job. I was calling around for him. I, you know, I took him shopping to get toiletries and took him to lunch and I just, once a week we speak and I ask him, how are you doing? And I just try to give encouragement. And one time I remember he got a job and I said, oh, I'm so proud of you. And he said, nobody has ever said that to me before. 
And it's just, so that's the kind of thing that I think people need a chance. We all want a second chance. Some people never even got a first chance, and that's yeah. why they're in prison. Yeah. And so people need to have a chance and to have an opportunity. You will hire somebody just off the street. You don't know who they are and what they're going to do. These are people actually who've paid for whatever they did, and it's less likely that they're going to do something. So anyway. And if I can just yes. add, um, redemption is real. And the reason I say that is if we look at Richard, He's, yeah. uh, he epitomizes it. And the reason I say that is because um, and many of you wouldn't even have known or thought that he's been in a prison before. Mm -hmm. um, I recall that my wife and I was watching American Crime and um, we were watch watching a, a scene with Richard in there and um, my wife loves Richard and I told him this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, Richard. I'm glad she didn't, I'm glad she didn't come, but uh, <laughs> otherwise I'll be leaving without a wife. But uh, uh, I say to my wife, I say to my wife d during that scene, I said, he's been to the joint before. Yeah. He's been to prison before. And my wife was like, what, huh? How do you know that? And I was like, because it's so authentic. It's so real. It's so raw his acting, but he was given an opportunity to take his trauma and put it into art and activate conversation to the general public about our criminal legal system and its impact, American crime. So believe in the redemption of the men and women and the people who are coming home from incarceration believe that they have the ability to make a difference and contribute to um, your corporation or your company or whatever it is that you're um, looking to hire them for. So does that mean you agree that they should take it off of the applications for Absolutely. employment? Absolutely. Ban the box. Yeah. Ban the box. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, when each of you think about your, your action lists, the, the priorities of things that need to be done to improve things, what, what is on the top of your list of, of the things you think are going to have the most impact or the things that, that really, you know, need to be done first? First, um, I think it's, it's loving myself so I could truly love um, others, you know, and those others is, is truly loving my children. You know, I'm a father of four, you know, and, and um, loving my wife, right? Because what good is the work? What good is, 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 is all this other outside stuff if my home is not okay? And it took me a long time to realize that because the world will tell you that you got to do other things, right? External, right? But they, we never really honor our, our children and honor the women in our household. And, and, and I feel that that is the completion, right? Because if my wife is okay and if my kids are okay, then that will make me stronger. That's how I start. respectful, be open, uh, give people an opportunity. I think, for instance, that formerly incarcerated people should be sitting in parole rooms um, because the other thing I've learned is that somebody who's been incarcerated has the highest level of intuition on <laughs> earth. They'll, nobody knows better who is ready to go out or not. They should be sitting in ju on juries. They should be in public office. Um, they should definitely be at the table for decisions that are being made uh, in legislature and whatever because somebody who's incarcerated or has been incarcerated understands what it is that people need, what's wrong with the system better than anyone. So, um, you know, anyway. <laughs> and my answer is sort of like uh, Richard's answer. Basically, I have high family values. And uh, that means the world to me, I think, uh, you can't do many things. If you're not treating your family right, how do it look like me? It's faking if I go out there and call myself helping you and my family is not being happy. So my answer is the same as yours. I'm in agreement with the, the rest of the panelists. Do unto others as you want done mm -hmm. unto you. Um, that's what it all boils down to. You know, treat people respectfully and um, in turn you will get that back. Thank you. 
And for the sake of time, we have about 12 minutes left. So I see we have four people up. So we're going to ask no more people come up for questions, but those with questions to ask your question. And panel, let's kind of understand that with time. Cool. All right. Um, do any of you struggle with uh, feeling like you don't belong in the spaces that you are in or that you don't belong in like, the work you are doing? Yeah, for sure, I, I struggle with that. Um, cause, cause I don't have no no brothers to bounce to, to bounce that those ideas and and like this is where I come from, right? And when I'm sitting in the in in this um circle of Hollywood, right? Like there's nobody that I could talk to about this. So I definitely struggle with it, but I don't question it no more. Like a lot of the before I used to have like a lot of self doubt, right? Like I truly didn't belong, and people will make you feel like that if you let them. But now I, I, I fully understand that this is above just what men and women, you know, I'm connected to God. And if God didn't want me here, he wouldn't have placed me here. So I, I, I try to keep that day in, day out. And um, as long as I stay connected to that almighty source, then that's what keeps pushing me forward day in, day out. Just to add to that, um my grandmother used to say to me while I was incarcerated and even before I went, um, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Mm. And that doesn't mean that it's not going to form. That means that it's not going to prosper. Mm. So even though I spent time in prison and I'm now I'm back out in society doing this work that is contributing to my healing, um, I initially I probably thought, you know, probably the first couple of months of me being out, I thought probably I didn't belong because there was, I left so many behind and I had so many connections. But I know that um, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be because as Richard said, if God didn't want you to be here doing this at this very moment, you wouldn't be here doing it yeah. at this very moment. So um, that's, that's my take on, on that. I can just say there's a yellow line on the ground at San Quentin Prison that says out of bounds. And when I get ready to leave, because I'll be there for like 10 days at a time, two weeks at a time, and I'm there like six days a week, sometimes eight hours a day. So when I get ready to leave, I'll say I'm going back to New York, and a bunch of the guys who I know will come and walk me, and they have to stand at that line and I have to leave, and I get to leave, and I turn back and I see them standing there, and I turn, and I don't think there's ever been a time I haven't walked and like tears haven't come down my face knowing that they're there and they should not be there and that they have something to offer um, the world. And so I, I now feel compelled, it's my responsibility, to make sure that this is, becomes a fair system and that people know um, about these inequities and that if I can create content that helps to just inform, uh, humanize, because I think that when we know people and we begin to see them as individuals, that's when it's harder to just do harm because right now we think of like men in blue, a sea of people who are wearing a uniform and you don't see individuals. Each person has, is a person and is a valuable human being whose life is worth something. So. No, I feel responsible. I mean, I, I don't regret or anything. <laughs> every, every morning when I, um, when I get up, I start my day off through meditation. Um, I deal with yoga mind-wise, um, something that I learned while I was incarcerated. And um, it humbles me. It makes me start my day off being very, like, open-minded, fresh, and, um, and it makes me listen to whatever God is talking to me for. So basically I follow that and then I, I listen to whatever I should be doing that day. And I do so many things, like I own four businesses and I work a job and got my own foundation. So I don't know what my day might start off with. You know, because it's so much distraction. I don't even want to call it distraction, but it's just so much to do where 24 hours is not enough for me. Um, but I love life. I'm 60 years old, 59, and I had to start my life all over again. So one 
no four, um, came out broke, wasn't a 401k they're waiting for me. So basically, I'm at survival mode. We're gonna go with the next question. The, there was recently a remarkable artist discovered in a Wisconsin prison who got a gallery show, and though he has a number of years till release, he at least is going to have a reception mm -hmm. when he comes out. Um, I, as a public defender, I had uh, young people who wrote remarkable poetry for great artists. Sometimes we use that in sentencing. Um, would programs within the prison, and I know they exist, which carried the work um, that people were doing in prison of an artistic sort, their expression, be helpful in the transition and are there such programs? For sure. And 100%. I, for, for sure. But, and so where she went, San Quentin is like this bubble in California because I wasn't in San Quentin and we don't got nothing coming over there. And, and, and like I've always been a storyteller. I've always been a poet. But the, in, the, in, in California, especially in the south of California where I did time, like there, it, it was non-existent. Mm -hmm. So it's like... Yeah, it would have helped. You know what? I, I, I wouldn't have reached the years of 25 years old to, to uh, find out that storytelling was always in me because it wasn't something that I feel that I was born with this, right? But there was nobody there to ever nurture that. So that was the reason why I have a poetry book. And I created this poetry book for these kids out of Orange County Juvenile Hall. So I was working with these kids for like two years. And all these kids were between the ages of 14 and 18. And they all were fighting life sentences. And I started talking about poetry. And when I talked to them, they, th they didn't know what I was talking about. So I was like, wow, these kids have never heard poetry. And, and so that was the reason why I wrote that poetry book. But definitely, um, it will help, and it helped them because the next week I came back and they had read my, my, my whole book. They were like, I already read it. And they were writing their own stuff. So it's just those sparks, but definitely, and why we're here is because of art. Um, so it, for me, yes, that's a definite yes. It helps without a doubt. Yeah. I agree, it, it, it definitely, you know, take, take away the dehumanization of prison uh, when you give someone um, the opportunity to tap into their talent yeah. and not only tap into their talent, but see their talent leave the prison walls before right. they themselves right. potentially and see how the world receives it and see how the world embraces it. That gives them hope that once they do make their arrival, they will be received in the same way that their art has been received as well. And art heals. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Art, there's no if buts about it. Art saved my life. Um, I just want, we talked earlier for a brief second about how um, the prison system was built on slavery and uh, we talked about um, rewriting the 13th Amendment. Um, so I wanted to ask, do you believe it's possible to reform the current prison system based on the system that we already have or the, would, would you believe the only way to really reform the prison system would be to eradicate it and rewrite it from scratch? I know a bunch of people who went, a 30-person delegation just went to Norway from the California prison system. Um, a friend of mine who was formerly incarcerated, and he hasn't even been out a year yet, he was part of it, and he was telling me about how it blew all of their minds. People from the governor's office, people from the COs, the police, everyone went, and they went into these, system, these prisons in Norway and he's like, they don't even have, the COs don't have handcuffs, mm -hmm. they don't have guns. Mm -hmm. The whole point of prison is healing. There is no punishment aspect of it. Right. It's like you did something wrong, so we're gonna put you here so that you can understand what you did, but people wear their own clothes, their families can visit, they can talk to their families. The whole point is let's just get you to understand what you did so you can go right back out. It's not about punishing you eternally, an eye for an eye, 
you're bad, you should never walk the streets again, or whatever. There are people who spend their whole lives in prison, and yeah. I don't know that prison is necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way that it is being run that it's a bad thing, because yeah. many of the people I know say if they had not been incarcerated, they wouldn't be alive today. So it saved their life, and then they had access to education and to figure out who they were because of that. But there's the point then when you've now figured out who you are and you're stuck there. Yeah. That's where it's wrong. There's something that's not quite right. So. And to, to answer your, to go over that, that's where the American prison was really created for. From 1900 to 1970, prison population was stagnant anywhere between 270 to 350,000. When we look at the prison industrial complex and how it works with capitalism, we see the increase for, for to 1990, it went up to 1 million, and to now, as Sean talks about, it's over 2.3 million. Prison was created for three reasons. One, to sit a person down who had violated against society. Two, to rehabilitate them. And three, to act as a deterrent so other people knew not to make in that manner. Prison was not supposed to be punishment. It was the punishment. We have now created it into a punishment system. Uh, this brother walked up late. He thought I won't go no. <laughs> But I'm going to let you go. We got one minute question. <laughs> no, we got one minute, so we got to make it quick. I've been standing here for about 20. Okay. <laughs> um, what's up, Sean? What's up, Todd? Everybody on the panel. And when I ask this question, um, I want you to think about it in the context of everything that needs to be done in underserved communities, um, children that, have, you know, that are facing and going through trauma, and their parents and everybody else in the community. So the question is, do you think from a psychological standpoint, is it more important for children from impoverished and marginalized communities to have peers and mentors who look like them, or should we be employing more of a all hands on deck? Nah, you need, um, you need people that, that look like you, for sure. And, and, and Say that again. You need people that look like you, for sure. But not just in the, in the physical sense, in the spiritual sense, right? Because the real work is not in the physical. The real work is in the spiritual. And, and, and it's in that energy, right? So a man or woman that has carried the same trauma will only understand another young man or woman that has carried the same trauma. And that's, that, that's through my experience. And um, th there's, and, and that's what, what, like, time and time and again, I, I, I share that with men and women that have shared that. And even yesterday, right? It was, you know, it, it doesn't matter if this was my first, my first hours in Milwaukee. Um, we went there and real recognized real, yeah. broken recognized broken. Yeah. Yeah. And that is where the work um, jumps in quantum leaps like that. Mm -hmm. Just drop the mic because we're going to end it on that one, right? <laughs> Just drop the mic on that one. Real recognize real. Broken, recognize broken. Those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Those closest to the pain to be, should be closest to the power. We want to thank our panel. We want to thank Sean, our moderator, Corey, Richard, Todd. Wonderful job. They're going to go over by the sign and take pictures. If you want to take a picture of them, if you want to have questions for them, you'll do that. We will uh, come back here in 15 minutes. So you have 15 minutes to take care of the needs that you have. Thank you.